it's uh, I think we'll get through it just fine. So hi, everybody. I'm Ariel Eigenbrad. It's so nice to see all of you on this call today. Um, this was a really good refresher for me. It also made me realize that now I want one of these new meters, Kate. Um, I had a meter and I was like, it's fine. And then as I learned about the meters that you're all getting, I want one of those too. It's much nicer. It has some great features that I'm going to talk to you about. All right, so we're gonna jump into, if you were one of those who requested to receive the HANA PHEC meters, um, this is what you're gonna get, this is how you're gonna use it. Uh, and here's a little bit of background as to why you might want this instrument. All right, so soil pH, basically it's a measure of the active uh, soil hydrogen. As the uh, hydrogen increases in a soil sample, it becomes more acidic. And as the hydrogen concentration decreases, your soil becomes more basic or alkaline. PH of seven is neutral, right? So anything below seven, we consider to be an acid substance and everything above seven, we consider to be alkaline or basic. And this is true whether you're talking about blood, wine, water, rainwater, soil, bleach. I mean, any of our, any of our solutions um, can be tested for pH. So why is it important to know and understand our soil pH? Um, I know the group that I'm speaking to, this is really a review and even a little intimidating because I know many of you can talk about this a lot more knowledge, more knowledgeably than I can. Uh, but in general, when we look at it from the ag and horticulture perspective, many plant species have really adapted to thrive or to live most successfully in very specific acidic neutral or alkaline soil conditions. And so when we try to push that envelope or we try to introduce species that are not adapted to our conditions, uh, we start to see a lot of, of issues. And some of this is because the relative availability of nutrients is greatly affected by your soil pH. And so certain plant species that rely on certain nutrients in concentrations to grow and develop normally are not gonna be able to access those uh, nutrients when the soil pH is wrong for that species. So a lot of times, especially in landscape instances, when plants are failing to thrive, it's often an indication that there's a pH problem. Lots of other things could be going on, as we know, um, we can't see underground, um, but especially with certain species, we can pretty much quickly pinpoint that pH might be at fault or the incompatibility of pH can be at fault. So knowing our soil pH can really help us to understand that soil. And it can give us some real good predictors of what plants might thrive in that soil, how nutrients are going to um, behave in that soil when we add them or we remove them. And it can give us a lot of information to make decisions uh, even when other test information is unavailable or perhaps cost prohibitive for a certain project or for a grower. So it really has a lot, uh, it can tell us a lot. It can tell us about some of the um, it, it just is, it's linked to so many other factors in your soil sample. Uh, and this is just a quick review, right, of the nutrient availability relative to soil pH. So we look at around a six and a half to seven, which is our sweet spot for most plants. Uh, we're seeing that the availability of our cation nutrients and our other nutrients are pretty available. That blue bar is wide at that point going through six and a half to seven, right? So this is where plants are able to access what they need if it's present in the soil profile. As we go down the line towards the more acidic soils, we see a lot of these cations become much less available. So we start to see deficiencies in phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, right? Um, nitrogen becomes less available the more acidic a soil sample becomes as well. When we look on the other side, right, as we look at going up into the alkaline or basic category, we're seeing that a lot of these cations are still readily available. Uh, and this is not gonna be a surprise to any of us who live and grow in the arid parts of the state in the Southwest, because we have high pH soils and we have often excess levels of some of these materials. But you can see where we get into a real problem here is that even if it's present in the soil, iron, manganese, boron, copper, and zinc become much less available right here in the seven and a half to eight and a half uh, range, which is where we see a lot of southern Idaho soils. And then we start to get into the really high pH, and then we've got all kinds of other problems. All right, so that was just that quick review. And one of the most common problems we see, especially in central southwest Idaho, where we're more arid, uh, is iron chlorosis. So our soil test may come back that we have plenty of iron present in that soil. What's wrong? Why isn't, you know, why are we seeing these symptoms? 
And that's because in that high pH range, the iron becomes unavailable to the plant in solution. And so we see this yellowing, uh, this characteristic green veining. And then the sample on the far right, we start to see that necrosis and dying back become pretty, um, pretty significant. And uh, those of us that have worked in horticulture, we pretty much know if someone calls us and they say they have a red maple, they have an aspen, they have a river birch, and it's doing these things. You know, one of our first lines of, of defense is, you know, the, the pH is just not right for that species. Let's try to work this out. There's some things you can do, but plant selection is really your best bet um, to, to not use those plants, right? All right, um, just a really quick review of the electroconductivity in soil and soil solution, because this is another thing you're gonna be able to measure with this meter, right? EC value is the salt concentration in a substrate or a nutrient solution. Uh, soils can sometimes naturally contain excess salts in arid and semi-arid climates. We do see this um, in some of our West Treasure Valley regions, um, especially getting into like Payette County, uh, the New Plymouth area. I've seen, I've seen some saline and sodic soils happening. Different, those are two different things that we don't need to go into today, but just know that it can sometimes naturally occur in these regions. But we can also increase our salt levels um, by cropping, irrigation, land management, over fertilization, overuse of animal manures. Sometimes we get a real buildup of those phosphorus and potassium salts. Uh, we measured this in decisiemens per meter or per millisiemens per centimeter. Um, we used to measure it using some different uh, measurements. So this has been a good review for me to kind of see what we're using and what these new meters are measuring um, this in. And it'll be in these two measurements. So what we're looking for generally is we want to keep, um, you know, we want our reading to be below two millisiemens per centimeter for seedling germination. Uh, and if we start to get above four, we're gonna start to see significant damage to plant roots and probably even death. So there's a range at which plants can survive, but if we're looking at the ideal conditions for them, we're looking for definitely below that two millisiemens mark. All right, so how are you going to use your new meters, right? Well, this is gonna be entirely up to you. Just a few ways that we've used them in the past or that we anticipated you might use them. Uh, you can use them to estimate the soil pH and EC in your own research projects. And I didn't put a little star here, um, but I say estimate, right? Because even though these tools are, uh, they're pretty good, right? They were a couple hundred dollars. They're, they're not the bottom of the line soil EC pH meter. They are not as accurate as you will get in a laboratory test, right? They're better than a test strip, but they're not, um, not I would say they're not as reliable or accurate as, um, you know, as laboratory tests. So I would say when you're using these, you are estimating, you are not giving someone a definitive, you know, bet your money on it value. Okay, so you can use it to estimate for your own research projects. You can use it as a demonstration tool uh, in your classes or your workshops or your field days, right? Because you're gonna get close enough, it's going to be accurate enough for those purposes. And then if you have clients or the general public that would just like to have a, a closer idea of what their soil pH might be or their electric conductivity, especially if they are uh, having issues. And I would say in a home garden, this is probably the most applicable way to do it because you don't always want to be responsible for uh, for commercial ag's decision making based on your your meter uh, but you could use it to perform you know maybe really low cost ph estimates for your clientele so this is what you're going to get right now they are all stacked up in my office behind me uh, and I'm going to be ship my staff and I are going to be shipping them out to those of you that requested it. So you're going to get this great black case that has the meter and a, a startup set of materials. You're also going to get uh, some cleaning and storage solution um, and some of this really great calibration fluid that comes with this particular model, right? So this is what you'll see when you open your box. Uh, you are getting the, um, oh, I've got the, this is covering what I'm seeing. Okay, you're getting the HI9813-6. This is better than the HI9813-5 for a couple reasons that I'll tell you in a minute. Um, it is portable, it is battery operated, and it measures pH, EC, TDS, and temperature. So this is your uh, user manual. I'm gonna send you the PDF of that. You can download it from Hannah. And it all comes also comes in very tiny print in your kit. All right, basically this is the interface of your meter. You have, um, you have a, a probe connector up here. 
you have an LCD display, uh, you've got a bunch of buttons for depending on what it is that you're going to be testing. And this little uh, four and five right here, these are your ECE measurements. You can either measure it in millisiemens per centimeter or in parts per million. So that gives you a few different ways to use that. But you've got your pH, you've got your temperature um, on and off. And then I'm going to get to what that check key is all about. But that is exclusive to this model. And that's one of the things that makes me want one of these and not the old one that I have. And you also have a calibration knob six and seven down here. These are actually knobs that you can turn and they're going to help you in calibration of the of the utensil or the, the instrument. So each of your meters is going to come with a nine volt battery. Uh, it probably is not the highest end nine volt battery, but go ahead and install that and start using it. Connect the probe um, and really you're ready. You're ready to get going. Uh, if it has never been used before or it's been sitting for a while um, or you've been keeping it in storage solution, you want to probably rinse that off in water and get it ready to go and turn it on. So we do need to calibrate these instruments for uh, greatest accuracy, right? Um, and so you're going to want to calibrate anytime you replace an electrode, uh, maybe once a month, you know, if you get it out and use it frequently. If you've been testing any aggressive chemicals or if you really want um, to be as accurate as possible. But what we have in this model is a calibration check feature, which is really neat. So you may only need to calibrate after you've tried this CalCheck and it fails. So what is this CalCheck feature? I was really excited about this because it means that I have to carry around less solution and do less little busy things before we're ready to sample. So you'd rinse the probe with water uh, and you immerse the probe in your check solution and you're all getting several um, little containers of check solution. Press the check key. And then the meter, if it's calibrated, it's going to give you a probe is okay message. Isn't that nice? Um, and if it needs to be cleaned, it might give you the clean probe and calibrate message. So to clean it, immerse it in cleaning solution for five minutes, which you're also receiving in your kit, and then rinse it with tap water. Put it back in that check solution, press the check key, and then it'll either give you a probe is okay message, or it'll say clean probe and calibrate again. And if it gives you that message for a second time, that does mean that you need to calibrate. So how do we calibrate our pH meters? And if any of you have old pH meters in your offices, this is a good review because this is how we get them ready to test. So to calibrate, you need to have some of the calibration solution. Your kits are all gonna come with this pH 7.01 solution, which is really good if you're gonna be measuring neutral or close to neutral samples. So in some parts of the state, that may be all you need. Um, if you're going to be um, measuring what you already know are going to be acidic samples, you'll probably want to get some of the pH 4.01 solution. Um, and typically in southern Idaho, we use the 10.01 for alkaline measurements because a lot of our soils are going to be 8 and, and, and above. So um, you would basically just uh, pour a little bit of this solution into a clean beaker or I'll show you some other materials later. Uh, connect the probe, put the meter on, and put it in, um, put it in that, in that um, buffer solution. And you might wait maybe up to 10 minutes just for that reading to stabilize and for your temperature to kind of regulate. Uh, it's also a really good idea to take the temperature of the buffer solution because to be really accurate, uh, pH is going to change slightly based on the temperature of the uh, solution. So um, what you'll want to do is have it in that buffer solution and then you'll adjust your pH calibration knob until the screen shows the pH value at the right temper at the current temperature and then your calibration will be complete. So this is the chart that shows you um, if your solution temperature is say 77 degrees Fahrenheit and you are using the 7.1 solution you should actually be calibrating to 7.01, right? That is gonna, you're in the right spot, the right temperature, there you go. Um, any other temperature, you're gonna adjust slightly up or down to compensate for temperature. So this chart also is in the manual and uh, in the materials that came with your probe, right? So it can be a little bit of setup early on, but any of you who have seen me use this in classes, once we get that done, we're off and rolling and we can test samples pretty quickly. And with this new model, once it's calibrated, you may not have to calibrate it again for a while, which is really nice. All right, how do we take our pH samples, right? What do we do here? 
So we prepare our sample. If your probe has been dry, we're going to kind of refresh it in, in um, the storage solution. Uh, we're going to put the tip about one and a half inches into the sample, select pH, stir it around a little bit, wait a couple minutes to, for the reading to adjust and stabilize, and it's going to show us the pH value. And then if you're going from sample to sample, you'll want to rinse and clean that probe thoroughly um, with water to eliminate cross-contamination. So how do we get our samples ready? So let's hope that the video works. This is just a quick one minute video from Hannah Instruments' um, fascinating YouTube channel. Uh, lots and lots of information on here on how to do it. So let's watch this for a second. If not done properly, inconsistent readings can occur, leading to poor soil nutrition. For the best results, use a container cleaned with distilled water, a measuring cup, a fresh sample of your soil, distilled water, and a magnetic stirrer or stirring utensil. First, put your soil into the container. Next, add your distilled water. The correct proportions of a soil slurry are one part soil and two parts water. Be sure to use enough sample to fully immerse your electrode. For best results, use a magnetic stirrer to mix your sample. If a magnetic stirrer is not available to you, use a convenient stirring tool, making sure clumps of soil are broken up. Wait 15 minutes for the sample to settle before taking any measurement. It should look something like this. With your sample now stirred and settled, Immerse your electrode into the sample and wait for a stable reading. Now that you have your soil measurement, you can now determine what steps to take, if any, to improve your soil nutrition. We hope you have found this video helpful. For more information, visit us. All right. I really like that video because I love the, the clean, you know, organized tools that they're using, that they have that magnetic stirrer, that they've got those beakers. Um, I'm going to show you how we did it in our extension office in Caldwell because it cracks me up. It is like the most extension you're going to see, right? <laughs> this kit was put together by Dr. David Johnson, one of my advanced master gardeners. Everything is perfectly calibrated to be accurate and to give us the right measurements, but it's all stuff that he just found in his kitchen. Um, so I love it. To, that This is extension, right? So you might want to assemble a kit so that you've got these things all together and ready when you're when you're going to sample. So I'm just going to show you really quick the uh, <laughs> the extension procedure versus the the very nice tidy Hanna procedure, which really looked like they were using a sunshine mix that was definitely potting soil, all that organic matter hanging out at the top of the sample. You're going to get more like you know this. Uh, so you start with your soil, uh, and no matter how much you tell your classmate, your class members to bring in just like, you know, a cup of soil or something, they always bring in a lot more. So David was really precise. He really thought that we should screen our sample. And I heard a question earlier, right? You don't have to screen your samples when you send them to the lab because they're going to do that for you. Uh, but if you want to get maybe a, an easier way to get your probe in there, you could actually screen your sample. Um, again, David was really precise. He screened it and then he actually rolled it with a piece of PVC pipe on a cutting board to get it really fine. Again, you don't have to go to those extremes, but this again is in encouraging the accuracy by preparing the sample this way. So again, we had that one part soil to two parts water. So he's got this one tablespoon there. We use Dixie cup, right? It, it works really well. You can get your probe in there an inch and a half. Uh, we always have access to these, it seems like an extension. So your one tablespoon of soil, your two tablespoons of water. Uh, and if you don't have a fancy stirring stick, um, plastic spoons often work very well for this. So let it equilibrate a little while, you know, let it kind of come to room temperature and then test it, right? And so again, here is using your buffer solution. Um, <laughs> anything will work, you know, this is a great way to conserve your solution get that probe down in there far enough. He's using an empty pill container. Um, 
<laughs> if anybody is on here who is one of our FCS educators, they'll recognize this thermometer. We always have a bunch of them around our offices. We use them for all different kinds of things like soil temperature and in temp uh, testing the temperature of our solution here for our pH. So you can see he's calibrated in that, in that 7.1 solution, right? And now we put the probe in our soil and we see what it is that we've got there. Um, and in this case where we've got an eight point soil, which is very, very typical for Nampa Caldwell area. All right, so I know I'm taking a lot of time here. I'm almost done, Kate. So uh, for taking an EC measurement, again, very similar. You don't have to calibrate. However, uh, you just wanna start with a clean container. And if you can use plastic, um, it's gonna minimize any, um, any salt or electrical interference. So tap the probe lightly on the bottom of the beaker to remove any air bubbles, select the EC measurement range on your uh, meter, and then wait a couple of minutes for the temperature sensor to reach the equilibrium. So if you just to take care of your probe in the future, regularly inspect your, co your probe and your cable, uh, make sure that everything is intact, there's no broken points, there's no cracks or anything like that, and really look at your probe stem or your bulb, it's glass inside of there. So you wanna really make sure that that stays protected. Um, the connector needs to be perfectly clean and dry. Um, and if you get any scratches or cracks in there, uh, replace the electrode and re really clean it off and make sure it's really clean before you put it away. All right, and there, there you go. You're on your way to, to testing the, the pH and the EC of soils. And it can be a really good thing. We use it in our Living on the Land and Master Gardener classes prior to sending in their soil samples, partly to see how accurate we are in testing that. And then just to give them kind of a heads up of some things they might expect. And then when they get their soil sample back, then we can go into it in more depth. 